Good afternoon and welcome to AP Calculus Office Hours. Um, I'm here, uh, Curtis Brown, I'm with Texas Instruments and uh, I'm here with Steve Kokoska and Tom Dick. I'm super excited uh, that these guys have taken some time out of their afternoons to, uh, to join us here and to um, do a little bit of office hours and question answering and, and interactive uh, calculus teaching with you guys. Um, I'm really uh, just want to kind of express from Texas Instruments that, you know, we're, we all understand it's, it's such a tough time that we're all in this together. Um, I'm glad that we get a chance to be in this together, um, but uh, we just, man, it's tough. It, it is really tough and we acknowledge that and that's why we're here um, doing this and trying to, um, trying to help in any way that we can. And so this afternoon we've got Steve uh, Kukoska, a former chief reader, and Tom Dick, a former uh, test development committee member, uh, here to share their expertise. So, uh, Steve and Tom, if you want to take it away, um, I'll kind of just host from here and we'll take it from there. Great. Well, thank you very much, Curtis. It is a pleasure to be working with you and had the opportunity to support AP Calculus teachers and especially to work with Tom. It brings back really good memories of uh, the University of New Hampshire, Tom. <laughs> That's right. So, you should. Uh, See my screen right now. What I'm going to do is start off with a couple of problems. Curtis is going to uh, keep track of any questions that come in. Yep, I'll uh, be but watching. I it might be, okay, I thought it might be good to start out with uh, something to do with L'Hopital's rule here. Uh, one of the reasons is because this was recently added, of course, to the curriculum framework. And although many teachers were uh, doing some instruction on L'Hopital, I thought it'd be good to take a look at a couple of problems. So I'm going to try the technology, Curtis, here. I'm going to try my tablet and see if that works. This will allow me to write on here. And let's take a look at this example. This is a very nice classic L'Hopital's example. And uh, there's some uh, a couple of good concepts in here. And I know that Tom will interject uh, with, hey, with some comments about that. Yes. I do have a question uh, popped up. Shoot from Patricia Brooks. Um, she asks if uh, we know how the students are going to be showing their work on the free response questions this year. Um, do you have any information with that? Tom, have you been in contact with the college board? Um, well, I did hear a message from um, Verge Cornelius, who's um, been really active in the AP reading as, as a, a question leader over many years. and. Uh, uh, there won't be any multiple choice. I, uh, my understanding is it's all going to be free response questions, but we don't have a whole lot more information than that. Um, so, you know, I don't know if people will be uh, scanning in their work or, or how that might be uh, the case. I would, uh, uh, I think a lot more information is going to come out the first week of April. So I would stay tuned and we'll, we'll find out more. Uh, Steve, maybe you have some more of the you can add on that. I don't know. No, I I got the same information as Verge. Uh, I uh, Stephanie Ogden uh, communicated with me last night. She has no other information yet. We just have to keep our eye open, ear open for what the college board has to say. I don't have okay, any idea. Thank you guys. Gonna... Yeah. All right. Well, let's take a look at this one. Uh, in this first problem, we want to take a look at the limit as x goes to infinity of e to the x divided by x squared. So this is a classic L'Hopital's problem. Again, there's some important concepts, I think, going on in this problem. And one of the first things we need to do is to, of course, verify the conditions are, are present here so that we can use L'Hopital's rule. Mm -hmm. So that means we have to take a look at the limit of both the numerator and the denominator. And uh, in the context of an AP calculus exam, I'm going to remind everyone that you should do these, take a look at these two limits separately. Now, I don't know how this is gonna work and don't write this down, but uh, you know, and some people would write up here at the top and take a look at this and say, well, this is infinity over infinity or equal to infinity over infinity. Uh, now we know that last year, if uh, in a L'Hopital's or the year before in a L'Hopital's problem, if a student wrote equal zero over zero, they would not get the point. So the point for conveying L'Hopital's rule. So I don't know how this is gonna work. So I would advise against that. So if a student has a L'Hopital's rule problem, they should verify the conditions in both the numerator and the denominator separately, something like this line right here. 
So this is of indeterminate form infinity over infinity. So you can definitely apply L'Hopital's rule. So that means we need to take the derivative of the numerator and the derivative of the denominator separately, just as an aside. Uh, not any of your students, but a common error here is for some students to actually try the quotient rule, which of course is wrong. So in this case, when we take the numerator, easy, a derivative of the numerator, that's e to the x, derivative of the denominator is 2x. And when we try to take that limit, we notice that both the numerator and the denominator are again, both going to infinity, both increasing without bound. So uh, we can apply L'Hopital's rule a second time. We take the derivative of the numerator, the derivative of the denominator, and then finally we can evaluate this. And this limit is infinity or does not exist. And it's interesting to me, we can certainly write this or use this notation. And we all understand that to mean that that limit increases without bound. So that seems to be, that notation seems to be okay in the context of an AP calculus exam. Now, Tom and I uh, both feel the same way. I think we both really enjoy uh, or think it's important to visualize uh, concepts here, visualize results. Um, my mantra is always explore uh, visually, explore graphically, work out the result analytically, and then confirm it graphically if you can. And I think this is kind of a nice graph here. It shows a couple of things. First, if you take a look at the graph of the original function, the original quotient, boy, that was a lousy arrow. Sorry about that. Uh, I realized that on my graph, I'm only going out to about X equals seven or eight, uh, but you can see that that graph, that original quotient appears to be increasing without bound. And although perhaps again, not sufficient graphical evidence, but at least partial, is if I compare the graph of e to the x and y equal x squared, you can see that very quickly that exponential function grows more rapidly than that power function. That was, uh, that was what I, when, when we were talking about this question earlier, I, that was what I first envisioned was, okay, so what do those two look like? Um, initially and how quickly does that exponential separate from the x squared and it's pretty obvious from that green and red graph there um, what we should expect the quotient to to do so i like that uh, got all three there i i kind of like you know this this gives you this graph if i did this ahead of time this graph gives you some indication of what the final limit would be but on the other hand it's not conclusive evidence because right. There is this numerical tug of war going on between the numerator and the denominator, and we don't know if there's some numerical compromise. And I'm just going to sure. scribble off to the side if I can, Curtis. I'm going to write one more for participants to try, not right now. But given this uh, expression, given this limit that we tried, they might consider this one. The limit is uh, x goes to infinity of e to the x divided by x to the n, where n is a positive integer. Uh, so that's the next sort of natural thing, generalization to take a look at. Okay. Hey, Steve, I'm going to pause you just for a second and make a shout out. We've got actually, we've got a seventh grader that joined us here is taking calculus. Uh, Chris Shiv, I believe I said that correctly, is hanging out with us this afternoon. I just wanted to, to point that out. Um, so we're getting some participation. And I also just want to make sure that the folks uh, at home who are watching know that they can post questions on the YouTube channel here. Uh, in the comments section below, you should be able to do that. Um, and please do uh, post a question uh, to those to that area there in the in the comments section for this YouTube live. And we will get to those questions um, pretty much immediately. Steve has some proposed uh, things here, but uh, we'll take care of those questions as we go. Tom, I apologize. Anything you want to add about this one? Um, you know, the only thing I, I, I might emphasize, and, and you actually already addressed it um, somewhat, Steve, but uh, up a little higher on your sheet here on your screen, um, I guess I would make the, the, the mention that uh, that symbol infinity over infinity is one you've mm -hmm. got to be really careful with. And I really liked yep. how you crossed out, you know, if you write that some expression is equal to infinity over infinity or zero over zero, 
my best guess is that that would lose points on the AP exam. However, it doesn't mean you can't ever use that notation. And I think you have an example just two or three lines down where you've evaluated the numerator and denominator limits separately. And then right under there, you said the limit is an indeterminate form of type infinity over infinity. And I think that would be viewed as completely appropriate language. You're not labeling a number or expression with infinity over infinity. You're using it as a notation for a type of limit behavior. And, that, and then, so it's not like that's universally verboten. Uh, it's just you've got to be really careful how you use it. And you've used it in a very nice way in that sentence. OK. Hey, Steve, well, one more off topic yeah, thing here uh, really quickly. Um, I've also got one more question uh, asked as a technical question. So um, what is the, the uh, the tool you're using to annotate. I've got one question. Uh, somebody wants to <laughs> about what you're using so what to I'm, annotate. What I'm using actually is something called PDF annotator. Okay. And so this file, this file was created with LaTeX, and the graphs were with Mathematica. And this is a PDF file. And when you bring it into PDF annotator, I have found that that's the best software for uh, being able to annotate and write on the screen. Yes, I know uh, Microsoft has OneNote and I know there are some others, but this one I have found that it is the most responsive, at least on my tablet PC. Cool. Thanks, Steve. Okay. Ready for a second one? Yeah, I think so. Let's go. Okay. Let's try this one. Let's take a look at the limit as x goes to infinity of the log of x divided by the square root of x. So we can think a little bit, of course, about the domain of this function. I'll leave that as an open question, and it will become more evident as we take a look at a graph. But this is another L'Hopital problem, and I'm going to verify the conditions once again so that the limit as x goes to infinity in the numerator is infinity, and in the denominator, it is infinity also. So this has the indeterminate form of infinity over infinity, and so I can definitely apply L'Hopital's rule. Now, this is a little different than the previous one. Let's see what happens here. So I start off by taking the derivative of the numerator and the derivative of the denominator. And in this step right here, I just wrote the denominator a little bit differently and without peeking off to the right-hand side. If you take a look at that expression and you try to evaluate that limit as that expression stands, as x goes to infinity, the numerator appears to be going to zero, and the denominator is also going to zero. It's just kind of interesting that the original, the original limit was infinity or in indeterminate form, infinity over infinity. I took the derivative of the top and the bottom, and now I have an indeterminate form. It appears as zero over zero. So my gut or quick reaction might be, well, I'll just apply L'Hopital's rule again. Heck, I did it in the first example. That's what I would have done. But, <laughs> but uh, it's always a good idea to try to simplify first. So if I simplify that expression, take the reciprocal of the denominator and multiply, I get this expression right in here, and it's very easy to evaluate that limit. As x goes off to infinity, the numerator is constant. The denominator is increasing without bound, and that drives the whole limit to zero. So that's a really nice problem, I think, that demonstrates, look, don't just blindly apply L'Hopital's rule second time or third time. Simplify the expression after you take the derivative of the numerator and the denominator. And down at the bottom here is a, a quick graph of this expression, this original expression, the log of x divided by the square root of x. Notice the scale on my x-axis here. It takes an awfully long time here for that to get close to the x-axis. But that is a reasonable graph. It seems reasonable anyway that that limit is indeed zero. Now, there's some really cool things going on in this graph, and I'm going to try to pass it over to Tom. Uh, it's interesting to note what's going on right here and very close to the origin. The domain of this function is x greater than zero. So I'm going to pass this over to Tom. Is that OK? Tom, you ready for this? Sure. I'll, I'll give it a shot. So I'll try and right. uh, Here we go. Steve, 
as you pass that over to Tom, just something for you to be thinking about in the side. Uh, we've got a question about uh, maybe perhaps an example of a, a typical accumulation problem that might show up on the exam. So uh, just be thinking about that while Tom's doing this. Okay. Okay. So if people notice, uh, can people see my screen? I hope here. This I think is, we got uh, it. So this is a uh, TI 84 plus. Um, uh, CE simulator, and uh, I'd already entered uh, the same function that uh, Steve was taking a look at, natural log of x divided by the square root of x. Uh, the graph Steve showed had a very, um, because he was looking at the limit as x approaches infinity, his x scale had included some very large uh, values. Uh, but we were interested maybe in what's happening closer to uh, x equals zero. So I'm going to go ahead and uh, just do a kind of zoom decimal window just as a first first crack, and got this uh, graph here. And so let's take a look. Um, and this is a point people might want. So the limit as x approaches infinity was of the indeterminate form infinity over infinity. However, the limit as x approaches zero is not really an indeterminate form. The natural log of x approaches zero, excuse me, approaches negative infinity. Uh, and the square root of x is actually approaching zero through positive numbers, but because it's in the denominator, that's just making this go to negative infinity even faster. Uh, on Steve's graph, it looked like there was a kind of a spike and it was hard to tell where that was because it was so close to the, uh, the origin with his scaling. Uh, but this looks like it's growing over here, uh, but we haven't hit a maximum yet. So we might want to try some other scaling. Steve, did you want to say anything in there or? No, go right ahead, Tom, kind of cool. Very cool. Okay. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and uh, change the window some. Let's see, we've got X-Men. Uh, negative 6.6 .6 to positive 6.6. .6. Let's try. So, um, let's. Why don't we try? Um, say negative one to. You're gonna get an error. Oh, sorry. Thank you. <laughs> Curtis is watching. <laughs> I wasn't fast enough. I'm sorry. <laughs> That's all right. Need to make sure that that. Uh... Holy macro, I'm not sure. Sign, what not the. Uh, okay. <laughs> right. There you go. Okay. So let's go to how about from negative one, since we're really interested in what's happening near the origin. And then uh, let's um, maybe go out to 12. Okay. And now we'll graph it. Okay. Now I think that we've, we've got a uh, graph that's probably including the maximum, because it looks like it's starting to turn around here. That behavior is kind of hard to see. Uh, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to go to the y equals menu, and I'm actually going to plot the derivative of this function, uh, because I think the change in sign of the derivative should be an uh, indicator of where that maximum is. Oh, sure. OK. Yeah. All right, mm -hmm. so let's uh, go to our math menu. And I see derivative and derivative down here. Um, all right, let's enter that. It gives us that nice 2D uh, notation. And I can just refer to it as Y1. So I'll go to Y variables my y1 and uh, I'll just put x equal x and we'll graph that. Oh, so the graph is really, really flat in here and we can see that by how close the derivative is to zero. So this is, it's a Nice indicator. This graph is making sense, uh, but I didn't get what I was hoping for as a more clear cut <laughs> indicator. 
of exactly where it crosses the axis. It looks like it's crossing somewhere in here, but that's, so we might want to change our scaling. Yeah, um, you could change your Y scale. While you're doing yeah, that, I'm going to just point out one thing. Uh, I got right. a comment oh, here go back from- to the graph. Yeah, go ahead, Curtis. So would they have to use L'Hopital rule for this limit as X approaches infinity? Uh, this person says that they uh, teach their students um, to uh, compare the magnitude of functions as X goes to infinity, and they think that the square root um, increases faster than natural log. And so um, it makes some good sense that the limit would uh, approach uh, zero. The limit would be zero as X approaches infinity. Boy, that's a, that's a good question. Uh, if this were on, let's say, a free response question, uh, Tom, I'll, I'll try and answer and then tell me where I'm wrong, okay? okay. <laughs> uh, if this were on a free response question, I think that uh, the, I think that the College Board would be looking for the student to apply L'Hopital's rule. On the other hand, we don't penalize students or we give credit to students for correct mathematical work. So in my opinion, if a student made an accurate argument about magnitude and about growing and about how fast certain functions increase or decrease, if it were a reasonable argument, a solid mathematical argument, then I would give them credit. Okay. With that, I would add the caveat, I think it would be difficult to do that. Sure, I think showing magnitude growth here might be a difficult thing. You can make some assumptions, but... Uh... Uh, you I mean, know, I think there are some uh, books that do, and, and it may even be in the course description where they, they bring out examples of the relative growth rates of some of the yeah. really important categories of functions, like the power functions, the natural logarithm, the exponentials. Yep. Uh, and so if a student was invoking that language carefully and correctly, I, I agree with you, Steve, I think they would get credit. Now, something that would overrule that entirely, though I, I'm not sure we would see it on a free response question, we might, is if you were actually directed to you, yeah. use, explain why, for example, I'm just making this up off the top of my head. Suppose you had a question that said, explain why L'Hopital's rule applies to this limit, and then use it mm -hmm. to find the limit. Now, now you've yep. been given a directive of the technique that you're supposed to use. Um, for sure. Much for like sure. Yep. if you were asked to use a trapezoidal approximation to approximate the value of a definite integral, well, now you're, you're actually being dictated to what kind of approximation you're supposed to use. So you wouldn't be free so to be just The comment is uh, now been, so they can use series expansion though, uh, perhaps. Oh, now that's an interesting... <laughs> Well, yeah, that would be uh, so in a BC class. Um, sure. Yeah, student could uh, do a series expansion of each of those functions. What do you think about that? Well, <laughs> I have two comments. First comment is why would you want to? And the second one, <laughs> the second one is look, uh, L'Hopital's rule, in my opinion, is easier than trying to use a series expansion. For sure. And again, if it's correct mathematics, a student would receive credit. I like it. Right. Um, Tom, are you, do you have a, that rescaled? Um, Cause I'm going to put Steve on the spot here for an accumulation problem. Here. Okay. Uh, I'll just do a real quick one. I'm going to actually invoke a, a zoom box and. Um, you can go based on the pixel. <laughs> So I'm just trying to capture kind of where I believe that that derivative must be changing sign. Sure. And let's just see if we get a better. Uh, okay, now that's just looking a little better. So that's that looks pretty nice. Yeah. And you can you can tell pretty quickly where that or right. a nice idea of where that might happen. And in fact, if I um, turn on the trace, get on that red graph. Um, and let's see, what does our trace values look like? When do we actually change sign? Looks like around 7.6. Yeah, 
So very close to there. Okay. Uh, and of course, you know, we, we could analyze that, but uh, just graphically, we can see approximately where that maximum occurred. Okay, let's turn it back over to Steve. So I'll uh, stop my share. Steve, are you ready to take it back again? I'll do, I'll do my best. Yeah, Tom. Okay, before we move away from L'Hopital. Okay. Um, yep. I have one more question on this. Uh, Ash Hart okay. asks this, um, do we get points for stating the conditions of L'Hopital's rule or can we just state why we need to use it? Well, I would say quickly that uh, generally there is a point for conveying that you need to use for conveying the use of L'Hopital's rule. Okay. Uh, usually, but not necessarily usually, the conditions. Well, I, I I don't know how to answer that one, Curtis. I mean, it's possible that there could be a point for verifying the conditions and then conveying the use of. It's possible there would be only one point for conveying the use of L'Hopital's rule. That might include the conditions. Uh, it, Tom had a good point, I think, a minute ago. If the problem says use L'Hopital's rule, well, then it's, you know, does the student really have to uh, verify the conditions? The assumptions are that the, the conditions hold, that you can. So I guess the best advice is, if you're going to use L'Hopital's on a, on a limit, verify the conditions, communicate that, and then conveying L'Hopital's rule usually means evidence of the derivative in the numerator and the derivative in the denominator. Right. Okay. Yeah, I would say it's probably a, a safe bet to, uh, if, if you're going to use L'Hopital, is, is to say why you're, you're able to use it. And so verifying okay. the conditions in any case won't hurt. Uh, so there may not be points directly associated with it, but it's a good plan to, to go ahead and verify those. Yeah and state that. Okay, one more, uh, one more question as we're transitioning, Steve, I'm giving you a, uh, giving you a little bit of time to do that. Um, <laughs> so can students, this is, a, this is another question, can students use these calculators for the AP exam as they are uh, only non-calculator free response questions? I'm guessing that that means that we're talking specifically about the L'Hopital's rule question. Well, I would guess that you wouldn't see a L'Hopital's rule question on a calculator active problem. Right. Uh, because, because there are certainly CAS machines that will give you the answer right away. Right. Um, certainly I expect CAS to see these on non-calculator for response questions. And so the answer would be. I, I would, right. Yeah. And, and I, I don't have any idea how they're going to do that for if they're giving three free response questions. I mean, I really don't know how they're going to handle that yet. Right. Whether they'll be timed or whether here's first one, here's the second one, and then the third one will be calculated. I have no idea. No idea right. how that's going to work. Okay. Okay. Well, I think we're ready for that. Uh... Um, so I'll stop my share and okay. um, hand it back to Steve. Okay. Here we go. All right, so what I'm gonna to try to do, Curtis, is to uh, give a quick answer to the question about accumulation and then go back. I actually have one more L'Hopital's rule and then a couple of other cool problems, I think. So I believe this question was about rate functions and accumulation. And I think that's a good one because, you know, on almost every traditional, <laughs> normal AP calculus question, we've seen on the free response, a question involving rate functions. You know, we go all the way back to people entering and leaving an amusement park. We have water coming into a pipe and leaving a pipe. We have oil coming into a tank and leaking out. And so in general, in these sorts of problems, we're often given a, a rate function for, let's just say, this liquid entering a container and a rate function for it leaving the container. These are often calculator active questions. Generally, these functions E of T and L of T are very difficult to take derivatives of. They're, they're almost, or they cannot, you cannot find a symbolic antiderivative of. And so the way that we generally use accumulation functions in this context is we might ask for, well, let's just say how much water is entering this tank over a time interval, let's say from zero to 10. Well, that's a definite integral from zero to 10 of E of T dt. 
this brings up another good question, I think, about the free response, and that is if a function is named in the problem, the students should use that name. Don't waste time trying to copy it again on a piece of paper. Enter it into your calculator and use that name. And then just evaluate this numerically if it's a calculator active problem. Similarly, we could be asking for, well, how much water is leaving the tank at a particular instant? And maybe we can pose this question, Curtis, and see if we get any answers on this. Okay. Uh, what sort of a, what sort of this expression, uh, what is this giving you? So this is kind of working in reverse. You know, often uh, the pre-response question asks something and asks you to translate it into mathematics. Here's the translation in mathematics. I'm going to write zero to T, and I'm going to write E of S minus L of S, and I'm going to put DS on the end. What sort of an expression is that? What does that give you? Can you translate that into words? So this is going backwards. I like these problems in my class. Okay. We'll look for some we'll comments leave. here. Uh, we'll leave that as sort of what people are question. saying there. While we're waiting for those comments, um, I am going to make one kind of uh, blanket statement, and that is that we we just don't know about the calculator usage. I've seen quite a bit of uh, around calculator usage on this at home exam uh, this this coming spring, and and we don't pretend to have um, the inside information on that. Uh, I think we will oh, Curtis her here uh, in a couple of weeks. Oh. I don't pretend I have any information, but Tom must have. Well, some this, at this me. is <laughs> the uh, the message I got from Verge it said uh, we don't know a whole lot. There'll be more about it on April third, but what we do know is it'll be open book, open note, open calculate. Okay. Wow. Uh, and wow. And we don't know how many free response or kind of what they'll look like or. And we shouldn't stress about that yet, <laughs> which she said <laughs> that literally don't stress about it because we'll find out more about the uh, that on April 3rd. But what we do know is open book, open note, open calculate. So. OK, well, thank you very much, Tom, for that, because I was about to say we have no idea. <laughs> <laughs> All right, well, I'm going to, if it's okay, Curtis, I'm gonna go back over here to a couple of problems. This is another one that involves L'Hopital, and maybe we can zip through this one quickly and then take a look at a couple of other uh, topics. In this one, we have to find the limit as X goes to zero of the tangent of X minus X over X cubed. Then there's some different things going on in this problem too. That's why I like it. So first we verify the conditions. Once again, the limit in the numerator and the limit in the denominator is zero. So this is an indeterminate form this time of type zero over zero, so we can use L'Hopital's rule. We take the derivative of the numerator, the derivative of the denominator, let's see, I think I've got the secant, I'm right here at this step, the secant squared of x minus one over three x squared, yep, I think that's right. If I try direct substitution, I get zero over zero, so once again here, I have uh, an indeterminate form of type zero over zero. So I'm going to apply L'Hopital's rule once again. You got to think a little bit about how I get that derivative in the numerator, I think. So to take the derivative of the numerator, I've got to do two times the secant raised to the first power times the derivative of the inner function. So there's a chain rule in there. The derivative of the inner function is the derivative of the secant. And that's secant tangent. So that's how I arrived at the numerator. And now here's a neat concept going on. I can actually split this up. There's the one third, that's easy. Constants pass freely through limit symbols. But I'm actually gonna take this secant squared out. I'm gonna apply a limit law here that the limit of a product is the product of the limits. And that limit I can get, that leaves me with this one here on the end. And let's see, let's see. Can I get that one? Well, let's see. I guess I'm going to have to use L'Hopital's rule once again. What happens as x goes to zero? Yeah, that's zero over zero once again. So I use L'Hopital's rule on that remaining limit, and I get the secant squared of x over one. That limit right here is one. 
hey, that limit, final limit is one third. That's a great problem. Not only is there a double L'Hopital in there, but there's an application of the limit laws in there. And this is a quick graph that I produced down at the bottom. And you'll notice that X equals zero. I'm gonna sneak back up here for a quick second. X equals zero is not in the domain here. There is an open circle there in that graph. And Tom, did you wanna show something with technology on this one? Um, sure, we could do that. Um... I think you mentioned something to me about showing open circles. Did you want to try yeah, that? Yeah, I think uh, what what your graph showed there uh, was a, um, you had a nice hole uh, where in the graph where um, that kind of indicated that a limit existed there. Okay, uh, the graph yeah. alone is not proof of that, but you were looking at that graphical evidence of the limit after you had done the analysis. Um, and yeah, right. uh, the question is, well, do holes show up in in graphs that you do on a graphing calculator? And the answer to that is it, it depends. <laughs> so I'm, right. I'm going to just do a, maybe a quick example. Send it over here. to you. There you What's are. that? There you are. Oh, OK. All right. So people can see mine. So uh, we were looking at this uh, uh, function before. Let me just clear that out. And uh, let me go ahead and clear out y2 also. And I'll just use a simple function here of uh, how about um, x, um, x squared. Minus 1. Whoops. Whoops. Let me. I want to use the right arrow key to get out of the exponent. So what I'm after here is uh, this is my numerator, x squared minus 1. Uh, and I'm going to divide by the quantity x minus 1. And I'm going to graph this. I'm going to go ahead and graph it with a uh, zoom decimal window. That's where each pixel is worth 0.1 in both directions. Okay. And uh, this is an example. I want you to notice that we actually see the hole in the graph. Okay. Yeah. Uh, however, that was because we had some really special circumstances. Uh, that function was undefined at x equal 1. That's because the denominator was x minus 1. In fact, if I turn on the trace, we can see the function formula up there at the top. And if I actually uh, trace over to x equal 1, we'll see there at the bottom of the screen, there is no y value associated there. The function does not have a value at x equal 1, but it really shows off that limiting behavior. It looks like the limit, graphically, it looks like the limit is 2 as x approaches 1. And that's something then we could actually do an analysis of to verify. Um, however, I want you to, to notice that if I just change the window just a slight amount, I'm going to change it from running from negative 6.6 .6 to positive 6.6. .6, I'm going to have it run to 6.5 instead. Now that's going to uh, change the increment of the pixels on the graph just enough that the hole disappears. Well, the hole really is in the function graph. It's just that we haven't landed on a pixel that will show that. In fact, you can see how the x increment, we're going to, when we get to x equal one, we actually hopped over it. And that's why we don't so, see- Tom, hole. do me a favor and sure. type in x equal one at this moment now. Ah, okay, so if I actually put in one, And we'll still see that value. You'll see that there is no function yeah. value there, but we're not seeing the hole. And that's because right. there's not a, a pixel value associated with the hole. And I think there's some value in, in uh, students kind of recognizing that that, that singular discontinuity happens at, at an infinitesimally small spot, right? I mean, it's at- Absolutely, it's at a single point. And so unless yeah. we are, 
lucky or we've orchestrated it so that we really do have a pixel associated with that point, we, then we will see the hole. Right, right. So I think that's an important uh, kind of thing to remember as we're thinking about these. Yeah. Uh, now, Steve's example, uh, if we tried it, um, let's see, that was the tangent. Well, I, I won't do it, but the thing is, uh, looking back at the graph, notice that if your hole is right on x equals zero, associated with x equals zero, your axis might cover up the hole. And so that's another reason you might not see it, even though it's- right. hey, hey, Tom. Yep. Do me a favor and uh, go to the table mode, or you could even split the screen and do graph table mode, but I think table would be sufficient. We had a comment on the screen. What happens if we're in the graph uh, table mode? What do we get there? So for graph table mode, let's see. The oh, you, you've got it here. OK. So we so see here's the table. We get the in the table. We see that that error coming up. The fact that we are still not defined there. Right. Okay. That's okay. good to know and good to see. Yeah. All right. Should I pass it back to Steve now? I think that's sure. A, good idea. Got a couple more, a couple more examples here, and a okay. couple more answers to some questions. Are you ready for me to stop sharing, Steve? I think so. All right. <laughs> Here we go, back to you. Fantastic. Okay, thanks, Tom. So uh, these next questions or these next examples are answers to some questions that I saw on the AP Calculus teachers page and some that have come into Curtis. Um, so I won't go through this integral and gory detail with you, but I thought this was a really good one. There's some interesting uh, ideas, concepts going on here. This is the integral from zero to seven of X times the cube root of X plus one. And a way to solve this is uh, via a transformation here, a uh, algebraic substitution. And what we wanna do is to somehow get rid of that cube root. And the way that we do that is we let u be equal to that cube root of x plus one. Uh, now to follow that through in my implication arrow or line here, I'm gonna cube both sides. So I get u cubed is equal to x plus one. I'm gonna take the derivative of both sides, the derivative on the left with respect to u, the derivative on the right with respect to x. I get this expression. That's gonna make it easy to bring everything from the x world into the u world. And I'm gonna make one more step here because I've got a lonely x hanging around in this integrand. So I'm gonna to have to know what that is in terms of u, there it is. This is a definite integral. So when I bring the integrand from X's into U's, I wanna drag along the bounds also from the X world into the U world. And I do that by substituting in the lower bound for X, the upper bound for X and evaluating this function U. So U goes from one to two. And so here's my expression in U's. Let me see if I've got this right. I got the bounds right one to two. Let's see, there's X in terms of U. Let's see, there's this cube root of X plus one right there in terms of U and there's DX, pretty cool. Now this works out very well. When I make that sort of initial leap from X's to U's, I'm lucky I kind of get everything in terms of U's. Now, one question that I always get when I do this is about these bounds here. Can I leave those bounds in terms of the X world? Well, technically in my class, you cannot, because now you brought everything into use, those bounds should correspond to use. But what about on the AP calculus exam? Well, some students will do this and write, well, X equals zero and X equals seven. And here's my response to that. And they'll have the integrand in terms of use. My response to that is, well, what do you plan to do when you finally get an antiderivative? Are you gonna go back into the X world? You can if you want, but that's not necessary. Are you gonna keep everything in terms of U's? And if you are, then eventually you're gonna to have to change those bounds. So my advice is keep everything or bring everything into the U world, change those right away. Is that okay? Sure, that's all right at that step, but you're gonna to have to do something eventually at the end to get an answer. So, um, so this is pretty I have one nice. comment here that came in. Couldn't we let u equal x plus one and then let x equal u minus one and change the limits in the terms of u? Is that what you're about to do? 
Uh, what I did, there, are, there, there certainly may be other ways to transform this into the U world. There is no question about that. But with my transformation right here, I have to use these bounds. Okay. One to two. Fair enough. Okay. Okay. So I won't go through all of this with you. This transforms this into the U world, into a polynomial, which is a pretty easy integration. Pretty easy to find an antiderivative. And as anyone can plainly see, this reduces to 1209 divided by 28. Okay. I knew what that would, sure, I saw that. <laughs> That's <laughs> a really neat problem. And again, this was asked on the uh, AP Calculus uh, teachers page. And, and Curtis, seriously, that was a good question. There may be other transformations that will work here. This one just seemed kind of natural to me, okay? It's Fair as enough, interesting, yeah. uh, Steve, because the um, the caller's transformation is the one I probably would have used, <laughs> so, which would be which just is U, what? Equal, U equal X plus one. Okay. That's what yeah. uh, was suggested here, was that U equal X plus one, and uh, then you let X equal U minus one. Mm -hmm. But you're, well, you're you perfectly it. good too, Steve. So yeah, so there's more than one way to, to get at that. If I'm looking ahead down the road, uh, does this transformation, Tom, leave you with exponents that are fractions, rational? Yes, yeah. You would have a u to the uh, one third okay. yeah. times the quantity u minus one. So you right, we got that comment one. also yeah. because of the cube root. That's why you did yeah. it the way you did. Yeah, yeah. Yes. Yours is a okay. more simple polynomial. Yeah. Okay. All right. Good. Here's another cool one, I think, uh, that was uh, on the- Oh, uh, Steve, before you get onto yeah. that one, before you get onto that one, I do have a question. Is there a way, um, a place where we can download the problems that are being uh, presented? Um, currently, you just created this uh, sheet for, for this particular thing, right? Yeah, I can certainly give you the uh, PDF. We can figure out, we may be able to figure out a way, Raul, um, to get that to you. Okay. Uh, I do have one more kind of plug before you get started on this, and that is um, just kind of a reminder to folks. We'll be watching this chat, uh, or rather the comments here on this video. So um, if you guys are looking for, um, you know, more of these office hours, we'd love to have your questions come in so we can be prepared uh, for these these uh, these office hours so that uh, Steve and Tom can answer your questions um, that way. I also want to put out that um, the software that Tom was using uh, just a little bit ago, um, TI has um, put that out on their website. Uh, the link is in the comments section um, where you can download that uh, for free uh, right now. So um, just a couple of things in there I wanted to make sure um, put a plug in before you get started on the last uh, little bit here. Curtis, may, may I also suggest if participants are interested in a brief like 15 to 20 minute content presentation on a specific topic, I think Tom oh, sure. and I would be happy to put that together. Okay, so if they'd like to make a comment about that, we'd be happy to do that. Okay. Okay. Yeah, that would be really good if they want to just like a specific topic rather than a question directly. I think that would be yeah. um, one last while we're making plugs, I'll just go ahead and put one more plug in here. Uh, and that is that you and um, and Tom have also put together a pretty uh, pretty good collection of videos and and things on the TI website uh, uh, called TI in Focus, and it focuses on specifically on free response questions from the last uh, most recent years. Now this year it might be totally different. Uh, <laughs> yeah, sure. fact, it probably will be in incredibly different. Um, but that would be good information topically for students who are studying. Agreed. Well, this is kind of a neat one, if I can, Curtis. I, I like this problem a lot. Uh, uh, this one is a uh, involves a table, and of course, thinking about AP calculus or calculus reform, we see a lot of problems now involving uh, tables, tables of function values. So this table contains values of a function f for selected values of x. And uh, this is a real, we probably won't see any multiple choice, we won't see any multiple choice questions like this this year, but this is a cool one. Which of the following statements must be true? 
So maybe we could just give 20 seconds and see if anybody can answer this one, but notice what's happening to S as X gets closer to two from the right-hand side and from the left-hand side. And there's a couple of really, I mean, this really makes you think a little bit, a lot a little bit about this one. Any answers on this one yet, Curtis? Um, I haven't seen anybody comment just yet. They say it's not okay. continuous. They say it's uh, not continuous. Well, I, I would answer that. That's not clear. I don't know the answer to that. Okay. I, I, I agree. It's probably not very clear that that's uh, not continuous because what? You're out to the 10,000th place, so we could still have some crazy and there's a lot of room there's a lot of room in there downward <laughs> spike there <laughs> so all right let's so, take a quick look at this i'm gonna make a guess i didn't teach uh i didn't teach calculus so i'm having to learn a whole lot from you guys uh every time but what seems natural to me uh to, okay. to see is that um perhaps um the the <laughs> b is the one that might be most like want to jump and grab it and say, gosh, it's gotta be that the limit as X approaches two is eight. But I'm thinking from this information, we can't determine it. Yeah, that's very good, Curtis. Excellent reasoning. Yeah, there's a lot of little things that you have to think about here. It certainly looks like this function is zeroing in on eight from both the left and the right. Now we're you know, getting some answers. A few A's. Lots of people mentioning oscillations, and then we've got um, several that are saying D. Okay, good. Not Very me. good. I'm... Did they win? That was just me. <laughs> well, look, there's a lot of things going on here, and, and I kind of picture in the back of my mind this function that's getting closer and closer to eight, but maybe there's an open circle there, and there's a solid dot at uh, the point two three. But look, the point sure. is, the argument is. We don't know what's going on here really, really close to two. So we certainly can't argue that the limit is three. We cannot argue that the limit is eight. We don't have enough information to say that the limit does not exist. We just don't have enough here. The correct answer is D. This is a really good problem for your students. I think some of you should try this tomorrow as a review problem tomorrow on. What do they call those bell ringers? If you can do that online, that's a nice problem. Yeah, I don't know how you do a bell ringer remotely, but that uh, <laughs> seems like a good idea. We did get a few comments about the density of the number line, and the key word here is must be true. Right, exactly. Yeah, very good. Yeah, must be true. Very good. Excellent. Excellent observation. All right, I got a couple of other comments here, and then we can we get kind of close to wrapping up, I think, Curtis. Uh, yeah, we got about five you... minutes here kind of uh, on, uh, you know, on this time slot, so. Okay. Well, one of the questions. Uh, leave me a minute or two because I have a few questions for the people out. Okay. Is it okay to say that there's a relative max at a point x, y, or is it better to say there's a relative max at a value when x equals a? Well, here's my answer to a lot of these questions. It depends. It depends on what the... <laughs> It depends on what the question is really asking for. Uh, you know, this brings up a really good question, a really good issue about general AP calculus free response questions. Students have to read the question carefully and darn it, answer the question. If the question is asking or saying something like, look, find the relative maximum value, then certainly it's looking for the Y value. However, we've had questions before where, it, where the question will say, find the value of X at which the relative minimum value occurs. And of course, there we need the X value. So uh, my answer to this question is initially, look, answer the free response question in the best way that you can answer the Don question. If it's asking for a Y value, respond with that answer. If it's asking for the X coordinate, respond with that. And sort of maybe in more direct response to that question, I would say something like this, I believe. I would say, for example, in analyzing the function, maybe in a summary of curve sketching, that F has a relative maximum value of 12 at X equal to 42. 
So I kind of, I tend to stay away from the reference to the point, but that's just a bias. That's just my own personal opinion. So okay. responding with, uh, yeah, stating what the maximum value is and then its location rather than maybe giving a, a coordinate point. Yeah, because we've had issues, Tom can probably help me on this. We've had issues where we ask for the absolute maximum value of a function over a closed interval. And students might respond with one seven. Well, seven's the absolute maximum value, but if they're giving us this, what is that? Is that a coordinate? If it is, do we award them credit for that? Do they not quite understand what the question is asking for? So we always have issues with that. Do we interpret that as an interval? Uh, you know, well, what do we do with that? So students, you know, there's a big emphasis right now on communication. So we want students to communicate properly, use the right notation. Yeah. And I apologize, uh, Curtis. I think I have one more down here, uh, one more answer to a question. Sure. Someone had, someone had asked uh, possibly for a content presentation on the definition of the derivative and uh, the derivation maybe of or the relationship to the alternate form of the definition. I'm not quite sure what that person is looking for. So in uh, an anonymous form, if that person would like to Respond to that, be a little bit clearer about what they'd like. Tom and I would be happy to prepare something, okay? Okay, that sounds great. All right, so I'm gonna pass it over to you if I can. I'm gonna stop sharing, okay. is that okay? I think I'm gonna just talk here uh, for a second. I don't really have anything for my screen um, to display, but um, thank you guys very much. First of all, thank you, Tom uh, and Steve for sharing, um, sharing your expertise today. Um, and I just want to put, uh, put out there to the folks who are watching and, and in the comments section, if, um, if you guys would like to do or see more of these, I know we've gotten one comment already asked if uh, we would do this every day, Steve. So um, <laughs> I don't think we're going to do this every single day, um, but we would certainly like to know um, if you guys would like to see more of these and what days and times would be would be appropriate. We'll watch the comments here um, and see see what we get, and then we'll be we'll be in communication via email and social media as to when the next one will be and and what time. Um, secondly, um, I just wanted to uh, kind of reiterate here um, that uh, we really appreciate um, everything that that you guys are doing. Um, and that the folks um, who are at home teaching and, and students who are at home striving to learn. I know this is, man, this is a trying, trying time and things are incredibly different than they were, um, you know, three months ago or even a few weeks ago. Um, it's, it's definitely difficult. And so we hear you and we're, we're doing uh, what we can to try to help. Um, so just, uh, we appreciate that. So I do see any day, any time. Thank you very much. Uh, in the comments. So um, we'll be watching and, and we'll be in contact about the about the next one. So thank you guys very much. All right. Thank you.